Uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, this uh, late evening, well, afternoon event, Save for the Future, uh, our panel discussion. Um, I would like to very briefly introduce our panel. They will uh, talk a little bit about their background after I've finished my part, so uh, I will do it very brief. Starting with Professor Ligesmeyer. He is uh, a well-known expert. I think uh, everybody has heard his name. Nigel Stanley and Mr. Pilz from the company Pilz. Um, before we are going into the discussion, I would like to highlight one uh, offer we are going to make after this talk. There will be the possibility of joining a guided tour. We will uh, visit uh, three companies who have prepared a short presentation from their side. Um, it will actually start with the company Infineon. Uh, they will show us uh, the latest development on, on safety hardware. I think you know probably their, their TPM devices, but also the RX uh, second generation, RX 2G. It's a very interesting device when it comes to embedded uh, safety. So if you're interested in that, uh, we can have a look at their current technology. Afterwards, we will go to the company Real-Time Systems, where we'll focus a little bit more on the, uh, let's say, firmware layer, hypervisor technology, separation technologies to build safe and secure systems. And finally, we will have a presentation from the company MathWorks. Uh, they will actually show us their latest trends in uh, application development, model-driven development, <coughs> and similar. Okay? If you're interested in joining, uh, I would like you to simply stay after the presentation here, come to the front, then you will all get a headset so that you can uh, understand a little bit what they will be uh, talking about, and then I will bring you to the different companies. Okay? Good. Then I would uh, propose that we maybe start with a very short introductory round and then jump into the discussion. Please. Okay. Yeah, I'm Peter Ligsmeyer. I'm the executive director to Fraunhofer IESA, and we do many, many things in systems engineering. Most prominent this evening, we are engaged in safety engineering. So it is easy to build systems somehow <laughs> at a certain quality, but it's not so easy to do it in a safe way, especially in such a way that you can definitely prove it to certifying agencies and others. And what we do is we try to well, get some grip on, on uh, new, new developments that we see, like artificial intelligence components. Everybody here probably has heard something at this industry fair here about artificial intelligence. There is no way to certify AI components these days. There are no methods, there are no standards, but it's totally clear that AI components will be integrated in future systems. So the question is, how do you build a provable safe system based on unreliable technology. That's not so clear. And the other thing is, everybody here talks about dynamic systems. We talk about Industry 4.0, we talk about autonomous driving and things like that. It's totally clear that these systems will modify their internal structure during runtime. So you can ask the question, what is the value of a certificate that has been assigned at development time? If the system, five minutes after switching it on, has a different structure which invalidates the certificate. So what I see is that we run into some, you could call it problems, I would call it challenges. <laughs> at least it's a good topic to do research on, and this is what we do. Thank you very much. Nigel. Thank you, Peter. Uh, well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us. So my name is Nigel Stanley, and I am the Chief Technology Officer and Global Head of the Industrial and Operational Technology Cybersecurity Business for Tuff Ryland. So we work across many different sectors, from autonomous vehicles to a nuclear power station to uh, railroads and what have you, looking at those systems and trying to understand the cybersecurity risks of those systems, and more importantly, how we can fix those problems so people can operate these in a secure way. My colleagues work in functional safety. So functional safety being very deterministic, 
it's very easy to prove that a, a system is safe according to an appropriate safety integrity level. When they then say to me, well, can you prove that the system is secure? I have to say, well, no, not really. I can't prove it's secure. I can demonstrate that the uh, system meets appropriate requirements, maybe a security level according to IEC 62443, but I can't absolutely deterministically prove that that system is secure. And that's a real problem when we now have standards such as IEC 61508, which says you can no longer be safe if you're not secure, as we see more and more cyber attacks on safety critical systems. So it's a very complex and very dynamic environment in which I work. Well, <clears throat> hello everybody, and my name is Thomas Pilz, and I thought safety is so boring because we invented everything in the 1990s, and you really don't need any research because the fundamentals are there. And here comes security, and the whole game changes. Professor Schiller showed at SIAS conference in Nancy that the Markov models on which you base the IEC 62061 and the ISO 13849 are not working the moment you bring those security guys into the game. And my colleague, Professor Nickesmeyer, just showed that in safety, the last frontier hasn't been reached. So I'm actually quite happy that my company is not a dinosaur working on a field <laughs> where nobody has an interest anymore. It's completely the opposite because the technology has come into a state where it all changes again and it becomes exciting. But I would agree with Nigel that security is definitely Superman and safety might be Batman if you go with the superheroes. You definitely need both to make Gotham safe and secure. Well, thank you very much uh, for these introductory words. I think we've already heard like two of the uh, most uh, challenging statements in the, this area. On the one hand side, we are talking about smart systems. We're talking about Im embedded intelligence. Yesterday, I don't know if uh, you maybe have uh, heard the uh, keynote from uh, Jim Tung. He's the CTO of MathWorks. And he uh, actually made a glimpse into the future where the company MathWorks is working on, um, really going into embedded intelligence, autonomous cars, cars taking decisions uh, on accident prevention, things like that, uh, questions, actually decisions which were given to humans right now, but the machine is taking over. Then the question came, well, how does that fit into the world of safety? Short break. Well, we are probably one million miles away. So my question would be a little bit, we, we see this opening gap between technology, what is possible, and standards, which seem to be more the dinosaurs uh, and, and blocking uh, the technology. Uh, how can we really extend these standards? How can we, we well, motivate uh, the standardization bodies to move into new wide areas? Well, I think it will take some time. It always has taken some time. So the content of standards typically is more than 10 years behind the current state of research. It simply takes so long to bring new technology into standards, which is a problem for companies that are on the edge of technology because they could do something which might not be confirmed by the current content of standards. But it's even worse than that. If somebody would give me the permission to write a completely new standard that would integrate security and safety, I could write some chapters, but not everything. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is there are still some challenges where we don't really see a solution, not yet. We work on that. I, I named two of them. It's only two of them. Another one is, uh, the colleagues named that, the integration of security and safety. There aren't any common standards for that. There are security standards and safety standards, and both treat systems more or less as if they would be static and closed, Correct. which is not correct. Everybody here knows that the current systems are doing dynamic changes, and they are open to something, to the internet or other things. They ask sensor data, and uh, they are not treated like that. 
And uh, the problem is if the security guys search their local optimum and the safety guys do the same and you put it together, it's not guaranteed that you get the global optimum. Okay, so composing the two results is not a permitted task. And uh, so I see much work to do. So if I can add to that from a cybersecurity point of view, I think waiting for a standard is a very good excuse not to do anything. Uh, there are many very good cybersecurity standards, such as the NIST cybersecurity framework, such as the emerging IEC 62443, which are perfectly adequate for organizations to take action today to deal with their cybersecurity risk. My bigger concern is why they are not taking that action. And I think they're not taking that action because they want to provide products that are as cheap as possible, and cybersecurity does have an expense with it. I think they're not taking action because they're not seeing a, a regulatory drive, so they're waiting for the regulators to tell them to do cybersecurity. Mm. And I think finally, there is a lack of leadership and governance in many companies that when you say, we wish to talk to you about addressing your cybersecurity business risk, because this is a business risk, they shrug their shoulders. And in my experience, uh, many organizations wait for two things before they do cybersecurity. The first thing is a regulation. So it could be a sector specific regulation or a, a more universal regulation such as the general data protection regulation to do with data privacy, or they wait until they have a cybersecurity incident or event that forces them to undertake remedial action to address cybersecurity risk. And I've worked in this industry for 30 years, and it's never ceased to amaze me how frustrated I get because of this lack of action. Yeah. So I think if there's one big takeaway today, that is that every company here should undertake some form of cybersecurity risk assessment tomorrow so they understand their cybersecurity business risk and then put in place some sort of a proportionate engineering-led process and, and project to address those risks. Well, it, standards, I gotta put some clarity there. In every standard it says, this standard is not intended to prevent the technology from advancing. A standard is an industry consensus on a matter where you need proof first. So when we invented the world's first safe stereo camera system, there was no standard for it, but there were some engineers that sat down together with the BG in this case and said, well, it's never been done, we wanna do it. Let's take an analogy to the laser scanners for which there is a standard. And then we started to work. We worked out what the problems are, we worked out what the tests are, and here we are, we have the product. After that, we went into the standardization circus and we wrote the standard, only to find out, oops, all of our competitors don't really want that product on the market, so let's make the test so difficult that 20 years later, you still don't have a safety stereo camera system. Well, that standard is now being revisited, and a lot of what needs to be done on the vision sector can be changed during that work. And the research that has led up to now can actually bring the expertise to the table to make those changes. So it's not the standards, it's the question, do I put too much in one pot? And I put up Superman and Batman earlier on. If you have Batman, he has skills. Superman has different skills. Superman you need to protect you from the cyber attacks, while Batman makes sure that the bad machine doesn't hurt you. Now, what is the difference between safety and security? Safety, you protect the human from the machine so that a malfunction that by accident happens doesn't hurt you. Security, on the other side, you protect the machine from the human. And the human has one thing in mind, make this machine break or pay somebody else or make sense, have somebody else pay ransom so that you can make money with it. So therefore, you need Batman, 
to protect from the machine and you need Superman and Superman is stronger and he needs more expertise and therefore you can't put them together. It's one coin with two sides, you need them both or your machine won't work. I, I like this uh, comparison with the uh, Superman and Batman very much. Uh, because especially considering that in Gotham City, they wanted to get rid of, of Batman for some time, uh, which is also a little bit uh, uh, the story I see in many companies. Uh, I remember one project I just did recently with a big industrial company, and they actually had the idea, oh, we want to be modern, we want to be IoT, we want to have our devices being updatable over the air. Big story, so the idea was, the company or the customer can buy a feature and then by pressing a button this feature will be in the machine. Um, the management was, was happy and they said well uh, we have a, a controller and this controller is certified according to SIL so no problem regarding that and it also has some, some hardware uh, encryption modules so it also has security so no problem. When we started to explain to the company that these components will help you to maybe build a safe and secure system. But the engineering work, and this also fits into your story, we, we have to first, or we first should develop solutions before we try to bring that into a standard, uh, is, is a very good approach. But I see in reality that there's a big fight when it comes to the question of money. How can we persuade the management that the technology is doable, but we have to invest? Well, first of all, I think management is trained to invest. It's only necessary to convince them that it does pay off at the end of the day. So management, according to my experience, would never put money into things that are not really convincing with respect to cost-benefit ratio. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, safety has a little bit different tradition because you have this third-party business, you have the customer, the company, and the certification agency, and they don't care about your cost. It's just they are the attorneys of the customer taking care that the whole thing is safe. But uh, there are published numbers from, from different branches, railway systems, for example, where we know that 30% of the total project budget is invested into the safety case, which is just the certification. There is no test case written no line of code written for that money, it's just proving safety. And if you spend 30% of your budget, then obviously management might be interested to get some of this money back. So if you can promise that the thing will be more efficient at the end of the day, then they would be interested. But this is, of course, a piece of artwork because yeah. we always talk as if it would only be safety. But it's not like that. We said it's safety plus security, but not only that, it's also safety, security, and availability. It's very simple to build a safe system. You never switch it on, okay? <laughs> but this is a system that's not available at all. And the whole thing should be available within a limited amount of time. You have a delivery date, and you only have a, 30, a specific amount of money. So this is a very, very hard optimization problem. And uh, it's, well, it costs some money and some effort, and I'm convinced that if you can provide fruitful technology that addresses the right topics in an efficient way, that management will jump into it. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think some of the problem is that the cybersecurity technicians and engineers like to talk in a technical language. So when they present to a board, they will use technical language that the board doesn't understand. So key to this is to talk about business risk, as I mentioned earlier. And, and I often see that, that my role is to, to keep the company that I'm working with off the front page of the Wall Street Journal for the wrong reason. Yeah? <laughs> what they don't want is the reputational risk and the impact on shareholder value for their brand to be associated with a significant cybersecurity incident. So absolutely, it's a business-led conversation, understanding the business risk, but being proportionate. We all want to have multi-million euro budgets, but we ex expect now we can no longer have that. So how do we produce um, enough security to address the problems that we see, but we don't over-engineer that? And that's a real expert judgment, but you can do that. And there are methodologies, there's expertise to help you do that. 
And I think finally, if, if a board member says, I don't believe in cybersecurity being a problem for us, then point them in the direction of the World Economic Forum that now features cybersecurity as a major risk to businesses. And if they don't believe the World Economic Forum, then I suggest you go and look and work elsewhere. Well, I don't know how many of you are working in a plant. And if you are, how many of you want to have the IT department in your plant more than necessary? And that's one mindset that security is having a challenge with. It's the IT department's problem, and when I got to call the IT department, everything is not working. So keep them out of my plant. They do the security. It's not even realized by the plant manager. The plant manager realizes I make 100 parts per hour, and with a change in the machine through those new algorithms that are learning, I make 120 parts. I'm buying this algorithm. And that's the value. Now here comes the safety guy. Oh, by the way, you're reconfiguring your machine. You need to redo your risk assessment to con conform with the EU regulations. Oh, that doesn't help me with 120. So why do I have to do this? Oh, because you're in Europe and BG can come in Germany and shut you down. Oop, that's the risk. And why do you sell safety in the United States? I started my career in the mid 90s when safety was starting in the US and my job was to go there and tell somebody, hey, by the way, your machine is not safe and you should buy something from me. Yeah, they looked at me and said, boy, here's the door because he got OSHA coming every 10 years, the company my size. So <laughs> you tell me about my power press making less parts because of your safety stuff, boy, get out of here. <laughs> well, you have those southern gentlemen all over the place and as long as you don't take the life cycle of the machine, the productivity gains, and the risk of a plant <laughs> shutdown for either a successful cybersecurity attack that makes no parts at all afterwards, or a successful cybersecurity attack which results in a fatal accident where the police will shut you down again, that is the discussion. But a buyer in a plant, he looks at the machine, he looks at the productivity, and he phases out every single cybersecurity topic and every single safety topic. Let's look a little bit ahead. Uh, we read that uh, smart systems, artificial intelligence will come because we, we have the hardware, we have the software, we have the tools. So the question will be a little bit how can we go into a qualification uh, circle? I I've discussed that with uh, one of the engineers of Bosch related to autonomous driving and he made a very short and very simple statement. He said, well, we're going to develop this algorithm to the best of our engineering knowledge. Then we will drive one million kilometers. And if it works, we will put it on the road. Now, we're not addressing the, the legal side yet. But, but would you consider this very pra pragmatic approach a good approach? Or do you have any other recommendations for a company who is going in the direction of smart systems, AI, and safety security at the same time? Well, first of all, the automotive industry is not the benchmark, <laughs> to say it clear. It is, you, you might look into avionics or maybe into yeah. railway systems uh, where you have real certification since decades, and nobody would certify such an approach if it, if it would be a commercial aircraft. That's, that's totally clear completely forbidden according to, to current standards. It might go through in the automotive industry for a while, but I'm convinced that this will not be the approach. I think we have to develop approaches that with guarantee would put something around an AI component that although the AI could fail, would make the system safe. You could call it a safety cage. I like that expression pretty much. So the question is, how do we build provable safe system on unreliable components? There are examples for that, like in communication uh, architectures, TCP IP. Mm -hmm. IP is not controlling the data flow, the flow of telegrams. If failures, faults occur, the next level makes sure that the thing is repeated. 
So it's possible to build reliable systems on unreliable components, and that could be a very nice approach. But we do not yet have the right technology. This is research. And another research is how do you then shift this from development time into runtime? Because if the system dynamically changes its architecture, it needs to be recertified over and over again. And you wouldn't call the guys from TÜV Rheinland to do that over and over again. So the system has to do it by himself. This is also a very crude paradigm shift. And it's totally clear we have to do it. But we do not yet really know how to do that. So there are many open questions at the end of the day. I see some trends. One trend is model-based development. So people try to, to answer some questions up front more and more. Not building up systems, doing quality control, figuring out this doesn't work, and doing some rework going into the next iteration. So modeling approaches are a very clear trend which also covers quality assurance. Quantified quality assurance is a very clear topic. And the other thing is these runtime technologies. We call it certification at runtime. And uh, it's, it's not so hard to estimate that my institute has some solutions for that. It's totally clear. Of course, this is our research. Um, I, I think the, the smart world that we're moving to is, is very exciting. Uh, and for a cybersecurity person to say that, that's, that's quite a, a strong statement to make. Because we always see that, that new features and new developments will always trump cybersecurity. So if a company had 10,000 euros to spend on a new feature or cybersecurity, nine times out of 10, they'll spend it on the new feature. The cybersecurity industry is very well known for saying no. So when they say we're going to have a new feature, you say, well, you can't do that because it's too dangerous from a cybersecurity point of view. That's the wrong approach. Uh, and my view is that the answer should be yes, but. And the but needs to be a measure of the risk and the likely impact if something goes wrong. Uh, and to your point about a car driving for a million kilometers, um, unfortunately, some people take that view to testing code, and that's why we end up with disasters in code. So that's a whole different topic when it comes to testing, but it's so crucial to get this right. Well, I said in the beginning, I think everything has been researched in safety already, and I'm going to be the bad guy again and say, <laughs> what you're researching on is really not our problem when you're on the system level. On the system level, it's easy because you have an application. Where I agree with you is in the embedded world where you have no system in mind, it becomes really, really, really difficult because you have too many variables. And that is where, to me, the application leads. That's why the car has a big advantage over the pure embedded safety approach. Porsche researchers know exactly what they want to achieve. They have the backup from the lobbyists, which in Brussels now have succeeded in making a mandate for every car built after, I believe, 2021 to have an active brake system under the speed of 60 kilometers an hour in the city. So that means we all with new cars will in the city, when the sensor gives us the wrong signal, get this emergency brake. Well, that is exactly the information the developers need to make the system more reliable. And once that happens, you have passed, you have paved the ground for autonomous driving. Once you have autonomous driving, you have the answer for how does a artificial intelligence, a learning sensor can be incorporated into a system. So unless we have a clear system task, all the embedded challenges are research and unsolvable. The moment you have a clear task, it's fairly doable. And I say that with, you, with the CAN bus, for example, when we invented the world's first safe bus system, the safety bus, we invented the whole matrix that's now 
in every engineer book about what can happen if you lose a package, you repeat a package, and what you do deterministically to work on an un unreliable component. So this is the advantage of the system developer. The embedded developer has it much more difficult. Yeah. I think the, the key problem is, is, like you pointed out, the number of vectors we have on an embedded system. If I'm talking to my colleagues who are working in the, the automation industry, they have a certain number of devices which are qualified, plug and play, more or less, and we can build a safety case. On software, on an embedded target, we have way more complexity, we have way more freedom. So my question would be, if we, if we actually give the advice to an embedded team, we are developing a very complex application. You already mentioned model-based development as one possibility to get a, a certain qualification into the code. This morning, we, we had a big fight between one presenter and one member in the audience concerning the use of qualified or of libraries in general. Obviously, we have like the two extreme arguments. If we write everything by ourselves, we know what we are doing. Versus, well, we have to finish somehow in time and we have to trust something. How do you look at that? Does it make sense or shall, uh, do we see more and more systems using prefabricated components or do we still have to develop everything from scratch? Well, basically, since many, many years, there is the notion of the so-called safety element out of context, mm -hmm. which is a component where you don't really know where it will be installed in the overall system later on. The only thing you know, it has to fulfill some safety functions. And the question is, how can you make a judgment about this if you don't really know what it will do? Exactly. And, uh, well, my answer to that is a very simple one, but it's not complete, I would say, we have to do the certification at that point in time when the system is integrated and you know it. So uh, there is the notion of design by contract, which doesn't talk about safety, it talks about functionality. It's, it's a very old paradigm in software engineering where I say, I have two components and they have expectations about each other. So I have some requirements as this component, given that component and vice versa. And then when they come together, when you build a system out of that, these contracts are checked. And this check may be successful or not. If it is successful, then everything is fine. If not, you're in deep trouble, mm. okay? And the same can be done with respect to safety. So what we have is a thing we call safety concept trees, which is a formalism that describes the expectation of a component given its environment and of course later on the environment is available when you integrate the thing into the system and then the contract is checked which is very smart because you can do arrangements that have never been tested before all right and this occurs more often today than a couple of years mm -hmm. ago because mm -hmm. we have many many developers of components and it's almost impossible to test every possible architecture that you could build out of these components. So it's much, much smarter to separate the two things, to say I specify certain things about the component and I check the fulfillment of these requirements when the thing is integrated into the final setting. Mm -hmm. I think that could be a good and valid step to certification at runtime. I think when we talk about software development, we need to understand the, the human factor. So developers are humans, or most developers are humans. <laughs> um, and, and therefore, like me, we tend to be lazy at times. And so if we can find some code on the internet to help implement a feature, if we can use some third-party code in our application to short-circuit the development time and to, to make my manager go away, then, then that's what I'll do unless that process is controlled. And this is highlighted or was highlighted about four years ago when there was a medical device that was deployed in hospitals that contained 1,500 third-party libraries of code, none of which had been tested for security issues. And this device had had to be taken off the market because of the 
multiple problems they had in these third-party libraries. So I don't have a problem with, with using third-party libraries if the quality of those libraries and the security of those libraries can be assured, but in many cases they're not. So that's the big warning factor is the human factor. Mm. Well, I think everything the other speakers said I can mostly agree with. The one thing that I can't agree with is the focus on software because it is a relationship between the software and the target hardware. It's the design of the hardware that makes it for the software different from a cost perspective to run on. And once you have an embedded system, if you only provide software, if you only provide hardware, it's very hard to find the link and say, ah, just take this, and I take a totally different example now. Take this cobot, it's safe, it doesn't hurt you. Well, this is the biggest marketing bullshit I've ever heard. Because a cobot is an unfinished machine that has to go into a line, and only then when the machine is finished, you actually know which of the safety features of your so-called cobot you really need and which ones don't help. So therefore, I think the embedded world has the big challenge to always keep the target hardware at least in mind with the kind of software that's developed, and then I can follow my colleagues again. Okay. I, I, fully I agree think I have to, to clarify my position. Mm. I, I didn't talk about software. It was just an example from software mm -hmm. engineering. Of course, if it is about safety, you always have to take into account the complete system. I could, I could say software is always safe as long as it is pure software. <laughs> okay. And it is never without failure and faults. <laughs> right. yeah. well, well, we can start an argument on that. <laughs> I, I actually have the theory that software degrades after some time by itself, but uh, okay. Um, maybe one, uh, let, let's uh, focus a little bit also on the topic of security. I mean, safety, obviously, we have like a big challenge uh, for the future because our systems are getting more complex and we don't have the perfect answer, but at least we have some ideas how we can address that. Uh, when we are talking about security, the, the really fascinating thing from my perspective is that we are now designing a system which has to be secure for the next decades, depending on what kind of a system we're developing. But if we're talking about machinery, if we're talking about cars or industry, we're talking about a lifetime of 20 years and longer. And this morning, we actually had an interesting uh, presentation uh, from one of the big chip companies. Can my quantum computer break my cipher code? So obviously, there are new technologies coming up and there is no secure technology which will last forever. So the big question will be, how can we design a system today that it will last for as long as possible? And if it doesn't last anymore, how can we detect that in time? Being broken, obviously, is not the best test case. And how can we update that, considering the very long lifetime of especially industrial solutions? Well, the simple answer for that is don't design a static system. <laughs> make a system that can be reconfigured after a while in order to make sure that it is fit for future requirements. So uh, I can give you an example. Uh, everybody in security talks about data access control, which mm -hmm. is nice, but which is not for the sake of doing big data analysis. I always say to myself, big data analysis here and privacy and security there doesn't go well together. I think that's totally clear. So if you don't grant access to the data, big data will not work. The question is, how can you control the access to data in such a way that only things that you permit with respect to your own data can be done and others are prevented from being done? This is an add-on to data access control. We call it data usage control saying you can specify today policy A and maybe tomorrow policy B because you have changed your mind. And that's okay. It might even be more than that. It could depend on the situation. If we would talk about, let's say, medical data, which is probably the piece of data that you would protect the most, saying medical data, my medical data, this is a thing which belongs to me and maybe my doctor mm -hmm. should have access to that, but nobody else. If you would have a heart attack here and you would lying on the ground, you would have a different opinion 
about that. You would say, okay, everybody could see all my data. Please help me. Okay, so it's the same set of data, different situations, and you would act differently. And I think it's possible to build this behavior as the functionality of a system. And that would be a good compromise between big data here and privacy issues there. And it would also be very flexible. So if you would make up your mind in two or three years, would say, okay, now when I was younger, I had a different <laughs> opinion about that. You could change the policy and everything would be okay. So I would actually argue that the, the systems that we're building today are very unlikely to last a long time. I think that we're moving into a built-in obsolescence, we're moving into disposable technology, and we're moving into an era of such innovation, rapid innovation, that technology is changing at such a rate that the idea of building a system today that has a lifetime of more than five years, I think is a very, very interesting debate. Within the industrial world, many serial-based technologies using Modbus-type technology, using industrial control systems, has actually been in place for about 30 or 40 years. Those systems are now being replaced as they move across into a, an IP-based commercial off-the-shelf um, hardware and software combination. And with that comes the obsolescence that the manufacturers of the hardware and software would impose on these systems. So if you look at the frequent obsolescence now of, of the Windows-based estate and how often we're now moving away and, and Microsoft is forcing people to upgrade to new versions of Windows, we're now in this, this constant upgrade cycle. I think the other challenge we have with, with systems that are designed to last a long time uh, is the notion of perfect forward secrecy. So how can I guarantee that the encryption technology I have in place today is going to be robust enough to survive some of the innovations that we're starting to see um, in, in hardware and software uh, and in terms of processing that's now starting to realistically challenge our current encryption models such that in the next maybe 20, 30 or 40 years, we might start to see that the, the current accepted encryption technologies could be undermined. So I think very much to summarize, I think that the, the world we're in now is, is in frequent obsolescence driven replacement of technology and systems, which is presenting us with a huge challenge in how we secure that and make it safe. Well, talking about the reconfigurability, how many of you hate your IT department when you get a security update and you have just 2% in front of management or a customer and your computer goes, Windows is updating, please wait. Now I asked earlier how many of you have to work on a shop floor, that's not tolerable if your million dollar investment machine has to be updated for security purposes and is not manufacturing. You tolerate the update if you manufacture 10 pieces per minute more, but you certainly don't tolerate it because you need to put in place additional security factors over the life sign of the machine. The biggest criticism to the safety people was when we changed from ISO 954 to ISO 13849 and implemented the probability calculation that after 20 years, your safety assumption goes bad. What? You mean after 20 years I got to take your PLC out while before it worked 30 years on my ski lift? You're cheating me. Well, the 20 years was done by BG because they had to put a time frame for the probability calculation together so that you can compare apples to apples. But the reality is after 20 years you got to rip all the safety stuff out. Now if you go into the life cycle management of your line, this is a problem. The big problem also is the, oh, we need to reconfigure every 20 minutes. How many of you have been in those, bring your, in those offices where you didn't have a chair anymore and a desk anymore, where you had to put everything in a trolley and roll it to the next chair? All of those wonderful concepts never work because the human is a person of habit. So the same is for every modular machine. Once it's on the shop floor, it stays static. Once you've designed it, it is static. You can reconfigure it, yeah, 
You can even self-propel it like it's being proposed by now, but the moment you reconfigure for the sake of reconfiguration, you're not serving the industry. Well, I, I pretty much share that opinion. If, it's, if it is industry, the domain, you're completely right. But I can think about different domains where the rules would be not like that. Like smart home applications, for example, where you say, OK, if I can, cannot rely on the privacy of my personal data that is collected by my smart home environment, I wouldn't accept smart home at all. So it's totally clear that the home would collect some data, otherwise it wouldn't work. So it would need the data, but these data need some protection, otherwise I would not use certain appliances. I would say, okay, not that. If I can't rely on the privacy of that, I don't want to do it. So I think the rules are a little different if it comes to industry, if it comes to mobility, maybe to things like IoT in general or smart home or even medical applications. Telemedicine would also be a very sensitive area, probably. Mm -hmm. so, so can I just say I don't really agree um, <laughs> because the worst okay. thing I ever hear in the industrial context is when I talk about cybersecurity and the, uh, the systems operators say, don't worry, the system is air-gapped. So they basically say that our system is secure because the main control is nothing connects to it. So the idea that you have a static system where the cybersecurity could never be subverted. I would love that to be the case, but unfortunately with a lot of the uh, new innovations in industrial equipment with the new innovation in the commercial equipment, they come with USB ports, they come with Wi-Fi enabled, they come with the ability for individuals on the shop floor to make changes to those systems. So I would say, yes, think about the idea that, that you've achieved a, a stasis within the system and nothing's going to change, but don't rely on that as your only cybersecurity control. Mm -hmm. Well, I think actually this uh, topic of uh, smart home is, is a nice keyword because I, I'm living in a pretty old house and uh, we had some problems with the water pipe. They broke from time to time. So uh, after the second insurance case, my insurance company told me, well, Peter, either you pr replace all the pipes or you add some safety features. So I actually bought a nice, very nice device which was detecting whether some pipe was broken and then it turned off the water. This worked fine for the first couple of days. And then it actually started to, to turn off from time to time. Okay. So I called the company. And they said, ah, no problem. We have a software update. This will actually fix this behavior. And then my house was out of water for one week until they fixed that. Um, so I think this, this update story, it, it's like a hand and an egg problem. Uh, on the one hand side, we need the flexibility because we cannot yeah. predict what the future will bring. On the other hand, it will be some kind of a vulnerability leak, uh, which can be misused uh, as well. Yeah, I pretty much share that opinion. Um, I've heard that some of these smart home companies have problems with their installations because they can't control it. Yes. Okay, you have many, many different things that measure something and do some actions and they are integrated into your wireless LAN at home where you also have some products from different vendors and you have, might, might end up in a strange architecture. And if you run into a problem like yours, <laughs> they have problems to reproduce it. Yes. So probably one solution might be you grant access to your home. But you do definitely, you do not want to give them access to everything. So this requires some very fine-grade data protection mechanism, like mm -hmm. this data usage control approach. This Correct. is what I mean. Yeah. Okay, there, this is an ingredient which is very crucial for the whole domain in order to make it work. Otherwise, people wouldn't accept it. Or industry would not be yeah. able to reproduce your problem, saying, yeah. okay, we don't understand what's going wrong in your home. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the smart home is such a wonderful example. <laughs> Indeed, how yes. Everything you do gets totally ineffective when you have your electrician putting in admin one, two, three onto the server where all of your wonderful modules are being downloaded and reconfigured so you can't break it. And I'm speaking out of own experience because we implemented smart home. Super cool. Then 
we had an incident where somebody stole my account and sold it on the, inter on the internet. And then we had a cybersecurity company do a cybersecurity check on our company and also on our home. Only to find out that all of the passwords by the electricians that installed it, including their alarm system, had admin123 or factory <laughs> setting passwords. And, yeah. and here we are at the beginning of the problem with cybersecurity. It's number one, awareness, number two, awareness, number three, awareness. And the weak point is the human in the whole chain. And no matter how good you make your software, there's always this password one, two, three, that if it's in the wrong hands, everybody can access my house, and that is really scary. So uh, my, my house, I have a, a dual home broadband, one over fiber, one over the plain old telephone system. I've got a Wi-Fi network. I've even got a GSM network, an industrial control network. What I don't have is a smart home. <laughs> I absolutely refuse to connect any of my household utilities or services to any computer system. I like the dumbest possible home I can get. Uh, and they've been trying to force me to get a smart meter for a number of years, and I just absolutely refuse to do that. And we are never home when they come to call. OK. Um, looking a little bit at the uh, watch, I would uh, like to, to maybe use the last three minutes to also get some questions from the audience. So if uh, somebody of you have a comment or a question, please welcome to ask to our experts. They're all dead tired and want to go. No. The lecture will not end without a question, so. It's been a long day. Yeah, <laughs> still. <laughs> OK, if there are no questions, maybe one finishing remark from my side and then also from your side. I think it was a very interesting discussion. We see that clearly from a technology perspective, we can do many, many things right now with, with nowadays technologies where we don't have answers uh, when it comes to, to how to qualify that according to, to safety standards and especially also security standards. Um, I think especially the, the final discussion about the smart home also shows very nicely the gap we have between capabilities on the one, one hand side, we can build smart homes, but on the other hand, if an expert like Nigel says that there's no smart meter in my home, this maybe should also give us a little bit uh, something to think about because, uh, well, especially when we're talking about security, how will the world look like in five years? There was one speaker this morning who said, well, probably in five years, the quantum computers will have the power to even break nowadays uh, very strong cipher code. We don't know, but we definitely know that something will change in the future, which we don't foresee at the moment. Yeah, basically, uh, I would like to conclude with, uh, well, a remark on a positive aspect of our discussion. Uh, I think that uh, at least the aspect that we discuss these topics is an advantage. I, I do research in safety engineering since more than 25 years. And, uh, well, in the mid-90s, it not has really been on the agenda. Mm. It was a topic for specialists, larger industry companies that had safety departments in order to support certification of railway systems or things like that but it was not being considered as a general asset, a general competence that everybody should have. And now technicians obviously are aware about the importance of these topics, politicians as well. I'm not really sure whether everybody un really understands at Berlin if they use the German word Sicherheit, what they are talking about, <laughs> because it could be safety, security, privacy, safety, integrity, or, a mixture of these. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's a positive aspect that everybody seems to have it on his or her agenda, which mm -hmm. I pretty much appreciate. Yeah. Um, so it's been a wonderful day. Uh, this is my first time at Embedded World, so I've learned a lot about embedded systems. And it's, it's been very exciting to be here. I think my one takeaway is that if anyone here has any control over the products that you produce, if possible, if it's a consumer device or an industrial device, always make sure that the default password is changed the first time the system is used. 
because believe you me, that will save us all a lot of problems. <laughs> and I do hope that you took something away from us chatting and it was a pleasure being up here and I thank you very much for inviting yeah. me to be here. Thank you very thank much. You. Super. Vielen Dank. Okay. So, thank you very much. Very nice discussion.